It's only taken four years, but we finally got John Carpenter and Toby Hooper on Sick Flicks. Strap in, because this one is wild. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner core geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're tackling John Carpenter and Toby Hooper's cult classic anthology flick, Body Bags. Released in 1993, Body Bags was a compilation of three episodes of a horror anthology series Showtime was developing, presumably to compete with HBO's Tales from the Crypt. The company pulled the plug on the series before it ever premiered, but they did take the stories and turn them into an anthology film, which went on to develop a cult following over the years. Its reputation is well deserved, it's filled with cameos from horror luminaries like Wes Craven, Carpenter, Hooper, and Sam Raimi, and the stories are definitely fun in that old EC Comics vein that made Tales so popular. But enough about that. Can body bags pile up enough corpses to earn a coveted five barf bag rating? Let's get to the gore and find out. Oh, and before we get started, today's video is sponsored by patrons Tanya Brown, Michael Shelton, and Joshua Delagrange. If you'd like to help sponsor some videos and free me from the shackles of YouTube's tyranny, you'll find a link to my Patreon in the pinned comment and description below. Every little bit helps keep the show rolling. And now, let's get bloody. Showtime presents. So even though they passed on a Body Bags anthology series, they were cool enough to give us what amounts to a pilot. Oh hey, John Carpenter doing his best Leatherface. Since Toby Hooper directed one of these segments, he was probably okay with it. But I bet Gunnar Hansen wasn't. Not gonna lie, kinda hoped a Carpenter joint would have had a better title card. This is pretty title card 101. I'm not even a minute in, and this already looks like John Carpenter's phantasm. You know what they say about the morgue, people are dying to get in there. Hmm, must be a union shoot. We have shot like 30 seconds of footage and everyone breaks for lunch. <laughs> not gonna lie. I love that they basically sold Carpenter on the idea of being a Crypt Keeper variation. He's legit great as a horror host. Lots of new arrivals. I call them the arriving departed. Fun fact, Carpenter spent like three hours in the makeup chair to achieve the look of the mortician. Honestly, he doesn't look that different from regular John Carpenter. It does look like he's pretty well stocked up on formaldehyde though. You know where you buy formaldehyde? Down at the coroner's store. But with drinking time over, he's back on the clock. Looks like it's open mic night. I remember my first autopsy in anatomy and physiology. I asked a buddy what he thought was going to happen. He just looked at me and said, remains to be seen. Ah, here we are. Body bags. Title mention, finish your glass of formaldehyde. And gas station establishing shot. Also in the news, another gruesome murder in Haddonfield today. <laughs> oh, very subtle, guys. I'd be more impressed if Carpenter somehow worked in an odd to Starman, honestly. The news is interrupted by the arrival of these ladies. Looks like they're arguing over the radio. Alex Datcher wants to listen to Keith Sweat, while her Karen friend is insisting on Shakespeare's sister. If Alex Datcher here looks familiar to you, it's because she was Wesley Snipes' flight attendant in Passenger 57. She was sort of a poor man's Halle Berry. Shame her career never really took off. Oh hey, it's Robert Carradine. Carradine has a bazillion credits and is one of seemingly a million cameos in body bags. Carpenter must have liked them because they'd reunite in Ghosts of Mars. Anyway, as it turns out, Anne is the new night attendant. Look at Carradine. He's like, I'm an ASE certified mechanic and I'd like to give you a 12 point inspection. Rawr. And now I guess it's basically going to turn into a gas station training video. And listen, when you get their uh, signatures, make sure you get the license plate number, all right? Right. Oh, and he's got some important exposition to deliver as well. Oh, you know what? This door locks automatically if you leave the booth. <laughs> I'm sure that's going to be important. Bill's going to head out, but not before giving Ann his number. Smooth move, player. And just in case you forgot we were still at the gas station, let's establish it again. Back inside, Alex starts her first shift. She looks as perplexed as I did during my first shift at a Cumberland Farms convenience store in college. <laughs> Worst job ever. Study time is interrupted by this guy. Oh hey, it's Wes Craven. Man, I miss Wes Craven. He's here to buy some cigarettes. Man, cancer sticks were cheap in the 90s. 275. 275 for a pack? What a time to be alive. I do love that Craven is just 100% all in on being the disheveled dude who might be a serial killer. Horror directors really are the best. Anne's in here pulling the old, if I ignore him, maybe he'll go away routine. And with good reason, because Wes is gonna shoot his shot. Yeah, I got some bourbon out in the car. Maybe I can get you to come out of that booth. I don't know. Bourbon's probably not gonna work. Maybe you should tell her he knows Robert England. Wes heads out and Anne has definitely had enough. 
I sure hope those airline people call me with an offer for that flight attendant job. I'm not cut out for this gas station shit. Her quiet time is then interrupted when David Naughton shows up. <laughs> Let's hope there's not a full moon tonight. Ah, yes, the good old days of the manual credit card charger. Do you kids even remember manual credit card payments? Christ, I'm old. And of course, he's gonna shoot his shot too by asking her if she wants to hold his stick. Hell yeah. No, no, not like that, you pervs. He's talking about meeting for a pool match. And maybe if I run into you sometime, uh, play a game of pool. It is kind of a missed opportunity that he didn't invite her to the slaughtered lamb. Just saying. He's heading out too, but she forgot to give him his credit card, so she runs out in hot pursuit. And if you guessed this was going to lead to her getting locked out of the booth, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. You could say this is a key plot development. While Anne's busy pondering the key mistake she just made, she's about to get spooked by a jump scare. Hey, need the key to the restroom. Oh, holy shit, it's George Buck Flower. This whole segment is like a horror movie convention meet and greet right now. Anne heads off to find another set of keys, and really, it's wild to watch this in 2023, because nowadays this whole problem could be solved by a simple cell phone call. And wait, why didn't they have a payphone out here? Holy crap, you thought the cigarettes were cheap? Check out those gas prices! A dollar fourteen? I remember those days. She eventually gets back inside, and hey, wait a minute, that's Sam Raimi! And why is his name Bill? Was a Carradine named Bill? I mean, sure, it's a common name, but I think something is amiss here. Anyway, I wonder if George is gonna shoot his shot too. I gotta pee and thought maybe you could help me out. Doc told me not to lift anything heavy. But before she can answer, she's got another customer. It's Deadwood's Con Stapleton. Peter Jason was another character actor Carpenter really loved. He collaborated six times in total. He's off using the men's room, his date is having a hard time fitting the nozzle in the hole. Hell yeah. No, I mean the gas pump nozzle into the tank hole. I will say that I love that Peter Jason is basically just playing the rich Texan from The Simpsons. See you around, Dolphish! <laughs> oh lady, you do not want to go in there after George Buck Flower. Trust me. <laughs> See, I told you. Don't worry though, things are about to get uplifting. This must be that elevated horror people can't shut up about. But it turns out Anne's not going down without a fight. She's about to throw a wrench into the killer's plans. Um, did someone just smear Vaseline on the lens? Uh-oh, we've lost George Buck Flower. That's a pretty terrible shaving mishap. Anne heads back inside to make a call. Direct to... Bill the Killer. Looks like it's a Peter Gabriel song up in here right now. Well, he's busy going Big Bad Wolf and finds the real Bill. Sam Raimi is really great at playing corpses. God, even the corpse is gonna shoot his shot. I'm very stiff. Bill's busting through the door like he's Jack Torrance, but he doesn't realize Anne has channeled her inner Mick Foley and is about to lay the mother of all chair shots on him. By God, she crushed his skull! <laughs> oh yeah, best JR yet. Hey, wouldn't it be wild if she was the psycho killer? I mean, she's studying psychopaths and all that. Anyway, she makes the rookie mistake of not making sure he was out cold or dead. And he's back for more. And here's Carpenter basically referencing himself. I feel like I've seen that shot somewhere before. Can't quite put my finger on it. She flees for the truck and it looks bleak, but she's saved by a David Naughton ex machina. I did not see that coming. But our killer's making short work of him. Right in the bread basket. Too bad for him, he slips on Chekhov's oil spill. And Anne has a crush on him. Literally. Oh yeah, get trucked, pal. And one last gas station establishing shot for the road. I feel like she probably owes him a game of pool at this point. Back in our framing story, John Carpenter's looking great. I call these my necrophile cabinets. Hey, settle down, John. Don't be stealing my material. I mean, really, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Speaking of, welcome to our second segment, the aptly titled Hair. Carpenter directed this one as well. Hey, it's Stacy Keach. We last saw him in Slave of the Cannibal God. Is it just me or could Stacy Keach basically be Tom Selleck's dad? Why was this never a thing on Magnum? Anyway, it's drink o'clock and I'm calling party foul because there's no J&B in that booze rack. Before he can even start drinking, his evening is interrupted by this David Warner Hair Club for Men infomercial. I'm not only the owner, I'm also a client. After my Roswell hair growth treatment, I bought the company. 
How do we not cover this for the MD hair sponsorship? Oh, sweet, it's brush hour. Come on over. All of this is interrupted when Sheena Easton shows up. <laughs> no, really, that's Sheena Easton. I guess she took the morning train to get here. God, now we're all gonna have that song stuck in our head. Keech is like, come on in, I'm glad you're here. I mean, here. I know this is about hair replacement products, but this whole setup screams Cialis commercial. Anyway, Keech is gonna show her his receding hairline. Probably should have put on a hairnet so it doesn't get in his food. Then after dinner, he figures out the perfect solution to his problem. How about I just put this dead raccoon on my head? Looks good, right? Sheena isn't into it though and rips it off. You could say there's going to be hell to pay. That looks ridiculous. It won't fool anybody. I don't know. I don't think this is what they meant when they said the ladies love a man who's ruggedly handsome. With the head carpet at dead end, he heads over to the Breath of Fresh Hair salon where Kato Kalin is gonna give him some tough love. You heading for Egg City? Hey, hey, there's no need to be domophobic. Bald is sexy. Look, it's FX guy Greg Nicotero. With the salon at dead end, he's back to square one. And square one is that GLH shit Ron Popeil used to sell on late night infomercials, apparently. That's incredible. No more dates about being called old man, but the babes are back. Probably cheaper and more effective to just buy a case of spray paint. Oh yeah, that worked great. I mean, say what you will, but that was a pretty bald move. Sheena definitely doesn't appear happy about this. I don't want to split hairs. Wait, I know this is a hairy situation. Damn it. I'm not trying to brush you off. Aw, oh, crap. And with that, she's off. I think we need to spend some time away from each other. I'd say parting was such sweet sorrow, but he's balding, so parting isn't really in his future. Out of options, Keech heads off to see Dr. David Warner. Hey, that's Debbie Harry as the nurse. Debbie Harry. I wonder if that casting was intentional. Anyway, Warner's giving him the breakdown. Basically, our procedure involves cutting hairs off your butt and pasting them to your head. How soon can we get started? I knew this ass hair would be useful someday. With that all squared away, it's time to pick a hairstyle. Christ, they're gonna give him the Rachel. We call this our stallion look. And now it's time for the unveiling. Looks like it was a success. Turns out he didn't get the Rachel. It's more like the Thalsa Doom. Or maybe Fabio, judging by Sheena's reaction. I mean, she's so into it, she's willing to give him a tongue bath. Hell yeah. Well, yeah, exactly like that. Well played, pervs. The downside is the Keech is coming down with a cough. Sure hope it's not a hairball. Oh, here's why. He's got bugs. I've heard of having some wild hairs, but this seems ridiculous. But it's about to get worse. And now it's like a Frank Sinatra song. You know, because he's got them under his skin. Jesus, he's either turning into a werewolf, Wolverine, or Attila the Hun. He should probably get some beard oil and stuff, though. That thing is coming in patchy. <laughs> oh yeah, Rapunzel has really let herself go. Turns out he doesn't have hair. He actually has little alien snakes. Needless to say, this isn't what he wanted, so he heads back to see the doctor. Great, he's full of these little snake things. He's more snake thing than man now. And here comes the swerve. The doc is an alien. When we arrived on this planet, we were tiny, starving organisms. And then we discovered that your brains are the only food on which we can thrive. Yeah, okay, sure. Let's just roll with that. Keech is doomed because the little things are eating his brain. But there's still time for one last day at the salon. And back in our framing story, We've got time for one more tail and one more drink. I've heard of a highball, but never an eyeball. With that out of the way, it's time for our final story. I. Not gonna lie, they kind of phoned it in on these titles. Not even a pun. Oh, and Toby Hooper directed this one. Wait a minute, is this just Major League? I hope this is a story where Jobu comes to life and starts murdering people like the Zuni fetish doll. Hey, this one has Mark Hamill in it. And Twiggy? There's a blast from the past. Hamill's like, hey, George Lucas, could you maybe get me out of this movie and into another Star Wars? It was a dark and stormy night. Yes, it's good they finished the game before it got rained out. This is what distracted driving looked like in the days before cell phones. You took your eyes off the road to change tapes. Oh dear. Man, Hamill is ramming some pole. Hard. Hell yeah. No, I mean he hits this pole. With his car. Don't worry though, he's fine. Oh, God. Somewhere in the afterlife, Lucio Fulci is smiling. Oh, honey, it's gonna be okay. You'll look like a pirate when you get your eye patch. You could play in Pittsburgh. Don't worry, though. He's in good hands because he's a patient of Dr. Roger Corman. And the doc has good news. I've spent the last 10 years of my life developing a method to 
transplant an entire eye. Unfortunately, Hamill's insurance probably isn't going to cover this. So do you think we can sell the baby on the black market? We can make another, but I might never find another eye. I mean, really, the true horror of this story is how much of a pain in the ass it would be for Hamill to get his HMO to pay for this surgery. Oh, I see what's happening here. Pretty sure we served those drinks at my last Halloween party. Judging by the width and depth of this shot, it looks like Hamill must have two working eyes already. Anyway, you could say he's definitely keeping an eye peeled. Out in the waiting room, Twiggy is late for football practice. And she gets some good news. The operation went smooth as silk. This is definitely a sight for sore eyes. I mean, he did not go into this with both eyes open. The surgery seems to have worked, but I'm concerned he might have a wondering eye now. And he's definitely turning a blind eye to Twiggy. How many more eye jokes can I make? I am unsure. Oh, this is how my eyes look after edibles. The next day, he's having headaches, and he and Twiggy are definitely not seeing eye to eye. But he is impressed with her new shampoo. Your hair, it's like silk. If I let you touch it, I'll have to let everybody else touch it. After getting his new lens, he's our blue eye boy again. When they get home, she springs the baby news on him. He looks delighted. Great, another mouth to feed. Crazy hospital bills. We don't even know if my eyes work. But at least she got him a gift. A crib? <laughs> I thought this was a present for me. Super, a crib. Just what I always wanted. Now I have to put it together. Things are going to get worse, though, because he gets shut down for sexy time. Maybe try some role play. Would it help if I put my lens in? Is that what's bothering you? But before they can do the deed, it looks like their corpse crop is coming in. Or not. It's okay, though. Twiggy will help him rub one out. Hell yeah. No, I mean she'll rub his temples. Settle down. House establishing shot. With nothing better to do, Hamill gets to work building a ninja warrior course in his backyard. Can you dig it? Then he hits pay dirt. Looks like that hole is about a foot deep. Oh, wait. Two feet. With that project not working out, he decides to build the crib. Um, I think this is going to need more work. Sides on a crib are useful. Anyway, it looks like he expects payment for his labor in trade. This is way better than that time I kissed my sister in Star Wars. Or not. Dude's really seeing things, and not just because he has a new eye. I see things. If he says dead people, I'm calling the cops. So, is Hamill going crazy or what? I'd say the eyes have it. He heads off to see the doctor, and I don't think this is what Obi-Wan meant when he said to use the Force. And if you guessed Hamill's replacement eye came from a killer, give yourself another screenwriter's credit. He was executed. He, he died in the gas chamber. Oh yeah, nothing says badass like peeling out of the parking lot in a Camry. Later that afternoon, he's back at work in the yard. <laughs> Looks like someone watched Troy McClure's Dig Your Own Grave and Save. I have to finish digging your grave. Or not. Pretty sure this still saves money, though. Killing you is going to be as easy as Bullseye and Womp Rats in my T-16. I don't know, his Brutus the Barber beefcake cosplay could definitely use some work. After some biblical jibber-jabber, Hamill's ready to heed the word of the Lord. If thy right eye offends thee, pluck it out. <laughs> no way I'm getting away with showing that, but yeah, Fulci approves. See, I told you that's where we were going. And back to the framing story. Then we get the swerve. Carpenter's a corpse? Who knew? And he's about to get worked on by none other than Tom Arnold and Toby Hooper. And cue credits. So, what have we learned from body bags? Well, for starters, that John Carpenter should have been in more movies. Dude's great as a horror host slash Crypt Keeper clone. Beyond that, I can see why Showtime didn't move forward with the series. It's good and there's potential, but these three tales are overly familiar to anyone who likes horror movies and they just don't have the polish that HBO's Tales from the Crypt had. I think they'd have gotten there in time, but it just wasn't meant to be. That being said, Body Bags probably did at least pave the way for Showtime to take another crack at the whole horror anthology thing years later with Masters of Horror. But enough about that. Can Body Bags carve up enough cadavers to fill five barf bags with splatter? Let's go to the gore card. In terms of gross anatomy, this one is pretty middle of the road. The practical effects work is solid, and most of the splatter is played for laughs and squirms and full-on gross out, but there's still some good stuff here, and lots of bodies in the morgue I couldn't show you. We're treated to throat slashes, a guy crushed by a car, Stacy Keach rotting from the inside out, two instances of brutal eye violence, the gruesome cadavers, and John Carpenter's ghoulish makeup. There's more than enough here to justify giving body bags a three barf bag rating. This was a fun and sick little flick. Looking for another horror film with a character running around in lots of weird makeup? Then be sure to check out my review of Pledge Night. You'll find a link here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. 
Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.